Hello, this is Bruce Anderson. Uh, I'm Extension Forward Specialist at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and uh, today we're going to be uh, talking about making small grain silage with uh, the number of fields this past fall and spring that were planted as small grains. Uh, we think that some of them may be uh, more effectively harvested as silage rather than uh, either grazing or cutting them for hay. or letting them go all the way to grain, and maybe even harvesting the straw off of there. Uh, this will be one way to get uh, uh, some forage early in the season, uh, and also might uh, enable a few producers to do some double cropping by taking the crop off early uh, and getting a chance to plant that second crop uh, as much as two to three weeks earlier than they would if they allowed the crop to go all the way to grain. So uh, we're going to take a look here today at making uh, uh, various small grains in the silage. When we're talking about small grains, uh, there's quite a number of different ones that we might be looking at. Uh, for instance, oats uh, that may be planted this spring, uh, as well as uh, some of the rye or triticale, wheat or barley that could have been planted that fall or spring types that were planted this spring. Uh, as we're looking at uh, uh, today's presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on uh, general silage making uh, characteristics uh, that we need to be alert to, and, and especially pointing out some of the things that are kind of unique to the small grains or, or may differ from making silage out of corn silage or, or some of the sorghum silage, looking at ways in which small grains may have some differences and we may need to manage a bit differently. Whenever we're looking at making silage, we have uh, some basic goals that we're trying to accomplish that will result in a, in a good, fermented, well-preserved type of feed for our livestock. And the two major things that we're trying to accomplish uh, when we're making silage is to, one, exclude oxygen from uh, that pile of silage so that uh, we can get the right type of fermentation. And secondly, uh, to have that fermentation reduce the pH down to a low enough level so that uh, the chopped feed will preserve uh, very effectively. In order to accomplish these two types of goals, uh, we have to go through various processes and various things will affect how successful we are. For instance, uh, in the process of trying to exclude oxygen, uh, one of the steps that we need to do is to make sure that we chop the forage at the right moisture content. Uh, this is going to influence especially the ability of that forage to pack well because of the weight of the moisture is going to uh, be able to push the air and oxygen out of the silage and as a result get the fermentation proceeding the way we want it to. Likewise, uh, chopping the forage properly and getting it to short enough so that it packs well will also have a, a great deal of influence. We want to fill uh, the silo very rapidly so we don't have oxygen and air starting to, to cause uh, any kind of bad fermentation on the, on the surface. Uh, we want to get it filled uniformly and, and be continuously filling, not starting and stopping a great deal, uh, which would end up uh, trapping oxygen or allowing oxygen access to the surface during times uh, when we aren't filling. Uh, the packing, the dense packing especially, is very critical to help push the oxygen out of the silage. And as we get to the end, once we're done making the pile, we want to make sure that we cover any exposed areas so oxygen cannot uh, seep in from the sides and cause spoilage and poor fermentation. Uh, in order to make sure that the pH gets reduced properly, uh, again, that moisture content uh, is critical at the chopping time and getting the oxygen out of there. Other things that we might be able to do to help reduce the pH is to make sure that we inoculate the silage uh, with the bacterial inoculants that are appropriate. Also, sometimes we can add uh, fermentable carbohydrates to help uh, improve the overall fermentation and get it going more rapidly and reach a, a lower pH that will preserve that silage uh, in very good condition. Well, what are some of the things that we can do that can manage uh, 
the, the silage and, and end up influencing how successful we are. Uh, I've got a list here of, of a number of, of different factors that we influence, such as when, when we harvest that uh, small grain, the maturity of the small grain. Uh, we, we can influence what the moisture content is, the, the chop length, uh, how fast we fill it, how well we pack, the sealing, and the additives. And I'm going to go through each one of these one by one uh, to, to quickly look at their importance and what we can do and how they can influence uh, the outcome from our silage making practices, beginning with the maturity here. When we look at various small grains, and, and in this slide here, I am focusing primarily on, on oats, wheat, and rye, which are probably the three primary small grains that uh, we are using as uh, uh, potential forage resources. They change quite dramatically in terms of their yield as well as the quality as the plants progress in maturity from the boot stage all the way to, to full, full uh, grain maturity. Uh, as you can see here, uh, as the plants uh, uh, go from the boot stage all the way to the milk stage, uh, there can be quite a large increase in the amount of yield from any one of these different species, uh, particularly uh, that stage from the boot to the bloom stage. Uh, but that also is a stage in which the quality of the silage changes a great deal also. As that plant is going from boot to bloom, uh, the stem of the small grain has to get a lot firmer, a lot stronger in order to support the grain. And, and as a result, since the grain has not as yet uh, started to develop, we take a look at the TDN down at the bottom and we see that all three of these small grains decline a great deal in their energy content as uh, the plant progresses from that boot to the bloom stage. So there needs to be a, a decision made early in the silage making process as to what kind of quality we're looking for in that silage. If we're looking for quality that's going to have high energy, high protein, we're going to be needing to harvest that crop when it's uh, fairly young, in, in the boot stage, to very, very early heading. Uh, but this will sacrifice uh, quite a bit of yield, as you can see uh, at the top of this chart. Uh, but if we're just going to be feeding this silage uh, uh, to meet some of the needs uh, of, of some beef cows, uh, then we can allow more yield to develop out there and still have adequate quality to meet the needs of these livestock. So looking at uh, uh, what we need in terms of feed quality is going to be one of the things that influence uh, the maturity at which we harvest the silage. Uh, unfortunately, maturity interacts a great deal with uh, the moisture content of that silage that we have out there. Typically, uh, we want to have silage that is at about 35% dry matter. This tends to be uh, the type of, of silage with 35% dry matter or 65% moisture that gives us some of the best fermentation, the best uh, production characteristics that we might be looking for out there. Uh, this typically on standing small grains <clears throat> will occur between the milk and the soft dough stage. So if we're looking for some real high quality silage, uh, we're going to be forced to have to windrow that silage, as you see here in the slide, and let it field wilt for a few hours in order to get the moisture content down to uh, the 35% dry matter situation. If we wait too long, though, uh, and let the silage get too dry and can't even dry cut it, uh, then we're going to get silage that's so dry that it won't pack well, uh, it won't ferment well, and as a result, we may not get a very good feed, won't get a very good fermentation. It could have quite a bit of spoilage. Also, uh, notice the kind of equipment that's being used here. Sometimes one of the things that really influences our ability to make small grain silage is the fact that whoever we work with to make the silage may not necessarily have the kind of equipment that is needed in order to make small grain silage. Uh, the typical head that is used for chopping corn or sorghum silage 
uh, will not do an adequate job typically for making small grain silage. They either need to have uh, some type of a pickup mechanism uh, on their header to, to pick up windrows as we see in the picture, or if the small grain is going to be direct chopped in the, the milk to soft dough stage, uh, they have to have equipment that will do that direct chopping uh, uh, of a solid stand of small grains out there. So if you're going to be making small grain silage and you need to work with a custom operator to get that accomplished, uh, it would be wise to contact uh, the possible operators early to find out if they have the right kind of equipment uh, and eventually get somebody lined up to help you that will be able to handle the crop that you're going to be using there. Uh, chop length is uh, a very important factor for helping pack the silage real effectively. And this is one place where small grains differ greatly from some of the other crops that we put up as silage. Uh, corn and sorghum, for instance, have a very solid stem. Uh, but the small grains have a hollow stem, and this hollow stem can trap oxygen inside of it. So we need to chop those stems into smaller pieces and have the right moisture content and the packing in order to push that air out of those hollow stems so we don't end up with pockets of spoilage and, per and poor fermentation in inside the silo pile. Uh, this is one area that a lot of times we make mistakes with and have a, uh, because it saves energy to uh, chop at larger sizes. Uh, oftentimes we want to, to save on fuel, but we need to chop small grain silages relatively fine, uh, having sharp knives that will cut it down to a 3 8 to half inch theoretical cut in order to get adequate packing. And so make sure that uh, if you're doing the job or you have a custom operator that's going to be doing the chopping, uh, make sure that uh, the knives are set properly in order to get uh, the small grains chopped down properly. Uh, of course, filling uh, rapidly uh, so that we don't have lengthy exposure times on the surface is going to be critical. And also filling rapidly with uh, adequate packing capabilities uh, will be necessary. As I uh, just indicated it in regards to the trapping of oxygen inside uh, uh, the stems of these small grains, uh, when we're packing small grain silage, uh, it might be better to have even more tractors uh, and more tractor weight out on that pile, packing it to, in order to get the silage uh, uh, packed effectively and the air uh, excluded from that silo pile. Uh, so that the fermentation will go on to completion and not end up with uh, some spoilage spots within that silage pile. This is always critical with all types of silage, but maybe even more challenging sometimes with small grains because of those hollow stems and their ability to trap more air inside that silage pile than a solid stemmed type of crop like corn and sorghum might do. Uh, when we get done with uh, making the silage pile, uh, getting it sealed and covered properly uh, also will help in, in making a good silage uh, that will be able to be fed out without much spoilage on it. Covering it uh, with plastic immediately and then using weights like tires to hold the silage down uh, can make a big difference in terms of how much spoilage we will have in that silage pile. Typical fermentation losses that we see in, in small grain silage, uh, maybe 5 to 10 percent of the total weight that we originally put into the pile uh, may end up being lost due to spo spoilage and fermentation losses. If we fail, though, to seal the outside and cover it properly, those losses uh, sometimes can increase all the way up to 20 to 25 percent of the total feed that was put into that pile. So it pays off handsomely to take the time, go through the effort, uh, make the investment in the plastic uh, in order to cover these piles and conserve the, the feed that we spend a lot of time and money trying to put into these small grain silages. Lastly, additives might be uh, uh, ways in which we can improve the success of our small grain silage. Uh, a lot of times bacterial inoculants uh, can be added to silage to 
hasten uh, and and make uh, more effective fermentation with small grains. Uh, uh, if they're made into silage during relatively cool weather, uh, these inoculants tend to be uh, especially effective. Uh, as we get into warmer temperatures, if temperatures start getting into uh, the upper 70s and 80s, which is maybe more typical of the conditions where we make small grain silage, uh, the inoculants aren't quite as valuable to us. Uh, so some of the Decision making in terms of using an inoculant may depend on a day to day weather situation and to what might be the likelihood of the right types of uh, microbes being naturally present versus those which we will add through an inoculant. We also can add grain to provide a more fermentable type of substrate to, uh, to our small grain silage. Uh, this is usually more valuable with the younger, uh, higher quality types of silage that we're trying to make because we don't have uh, any grain if we're making the silage as a boot stage to, to uh, blooming stage. Uh, after we get to the, the milk stage and soft dough, uh, we'll have some grain there to provide more fermentable carbohydrates, but earlier uh, made small grain silage uh, may benefit from having some ground corn uh, or molasses or other fermentable aid added to that silage to make it uh, uh, ferment more rapidly and get that pH down to uh, a lower level which will preserve uh, more effectively. So quickly reviewing the, the, the seven factors that I've identified here today that we can manage uh, and influence the quality and success of our silage making. Uh, we have that. We see that there's a lot of interactions among them. We may want to make uh, silage at a certain maturity, uh, but it may not be the right moisture at that time, and so we have to uh, adjust either the maturity or make sure that we uh, uh, adjust the moisture properly. Uh, as uh, the forage gets a little drier, uh, we may need to chop a little bit shorter. We may need to pack with a little heavier equipment in order to force that oxygen out. Uh, if it gets a little bit too wet, uh, where we're afraid that we might be having some seepage, uh, especially if we end up with moisture contents exceeding 70%, then maybe that uh, chop length can be uh, increased a little bit uh, uh, so that we don't have uh, quite as uh, dense a packing going on. All of these factors, uh, though, will influence how successful we are with making our small grain silage. Uh, to, to finally summarize here, I think that when we're looking at making small grain silage, probably the three main factors that we need to be looking at to be most successful is first and foremost making that silage at the right moisture content, whether we're direct chopping it at the right stage of maturity or whether we're windrowing it early, letting it dry in the windrow, and then chopping it when it has reached uh, the moisture level of about 65% moisture, 35% dry matter, to make a very good silage. Also, because these are hollow stemmed plants, chopping these small grains a little bit finer than what we might, uh, some other types of, of silages is going to be critical to avoid some of the air trappage that may occur uh, in these silages. And finally, uh, covering the silage, preserving what we have made well uh, is, is very important, uh, especially since most of the silage is going to be made during hotter times when spoilage can start occurring much more rapidly than uh, during cool fall weather when we make our corn silage and forage sorghum silage. Uh, this will help preserve it over a longer time period and assure that we have a good feed to provide to the livestock when we decide we're going to be feeding that 